Let's turn to 2 Peter this morning. Well, before you turn to 2 Peter, go back to 1 Peter in chapter 5. We just want to finish up that last block of Scripture. Clark, do we still have the magazines out front, Calvary Chapel magazines? Do we still have them? They're all gone? Oh, praise God. Okay, so everybody took a Calvary Chapel magazine. Amen. It's a blessing. It's good to have Clark and Cindy back with us. Amen? Amen. It's always good to have our pastor back and his wonderful wife, and we pray that they have been refreshed. They definitely have that just back from vacation glow. (laughs) Amen. So let's just go back to the last part of chapter 5. Uh, it's just going to, I just want to finish up just so that we know that we've completed that chapter. So we're going to start there at, at verse 12. And um, then we'll be moving over. We're going to be shifting gears quickly over to 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's pray. And then let's go into the word. Father God, in Jesus' name, Lord, once again, we come to the one who By your grace, Lord, you spoke these words to men who you, within your trust, Lord, that you have touched their hearts and inspired them to write these things, Lord. And we have access to these things, which is just so amazing to me that we actually can hold and read the word of God, the life-giving word that can only come from a life-giving God. So we thank you this morning for the privilege of being able to sit under your word, Lord, and to hear you teach us as you open your mouth and just use this old broken vessel, Lord, to speak your truth. Father, be with us today. Be manifested in here this morning. Let us hear everything, Lord, that you desire for us to hear. Let it work in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We commit it to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we look back here in chapter 5 of 1 Peter, we finished up the fact that we just talked about the fact that that we have an enemy. We finished up with the fact that we have an enemy. And even in suffering, this enemy continues to be active. So because of that, we have to be sober and we have to be vigilant, as it says in verse 8. And then he switches there in verse 10. It says, but the God of all, but may the God of all grace who called us by his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever. Amen. So the suffering does come first and then we receive the glory But then over here in verse 12, as we finish it off between verse 12 and verse uh, 14, it's just his farewell. And basically what he just says here, uh, he he talks about Savanius is the first one. He says, by Savanius, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. So he he mentions the name Savanius. And Savanius, as you know, you probably remember him from Paul. He was one of Paul's traveling companions as well. So he was a faithful brother. He was faithful in ministry, and he was a loyal brother to the uh, apostles that he traveled with. So he also uh, did some ministry with Peter as well near the end. And then in verse 13, it says, she who was in Babylon, and this she that they're referring to is, is actually the local church. He refers to the local church as she just as we are the bride of Christ as the church. Uh, So he refers to her as she who is in Babylon. In Babylon, as we mentioned, I believe we mentioned last week, that Babylon was a cold word for uh, Rome, Uh, very much like Rome in terms of the sin and the debauchery and all those things that happened in Rome, the paganism. So it was a cold word for Rome. And, and, And by using Babylon... Uh, when they would send letters to different places, if those letters would be intercepted, then the, the writer, who was Peter in this case, uh, would not, they would not be giving away their location <laughs> or be giving away the people that he's, that he's referring to. So it's a cold word. And it said, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Now, this is John Mark, 
who also traveled with Paul briefly, and then later in 2 Timothy, after they had their disagreement and they went separate ways, Mark went with uh, Mark went with Barnabas, and of course Paul ended up going with uh, Silas. But they reconnected. The Lord brought made sure that they reconciled before Paul left this world, and um, Mark also being the son, being the spiritual son to Peter. And many believe that the book of Mark uh, was actually uh, uh, Peter's account of the gospel written by Mark. And it says, greet one another with a kiss of love. And a kiss of love is like a spiritual kiss or a holy kiss, as they used to call it. It was common back in those times for people to uh, greet each other with a kiss and not so much a hug. Today we do it with a hug and not so much a kiss per se. But our holy kiss is a holy hug, which we give. And we know that Christians love to hug each other. You see it all day long, right? Christians love to hug. And that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing because we are a family. And we should enjoy uh, showing appropriate affection to one another. That's spiritual affection. So closing out, that closes out uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. And we now shift over to 2 Peter. So we're going to start right here at verse 1 with 2 Peter. And before we do that, um, I just want to say that it's very, very, very important that we understand or that we remember exactly what we received in power when we gave our lives to Christ, when we recognize our faith in Christ Jesus. It's very important that we understand what transpired at that time and the power that we have and the access that we have to the things of God as a result of us now being in the family of God. So before we go into reading first um, uh, that chapter, chapter 1, uh, verse 1, I want to just move over just very, very quickly over to Romans chapter 5. And I want to read that first. Romans chapter 5. And in Romans chapter 5, just want to read verses 1 through 5, which actually talks about, again, how faith, when we receive our faith, we have access to things in God. And Paul talks about it just as Peter will be talking about it. So just kind of show you just how parallel those two apostles were. So in Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, it says this, Therefore... Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces Perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. Now, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So those are the things that we have access to and being justified by faith. And Peter's going to go into that a little bit more as well. So let's just start. And so keep that in mind as we begin to move through verses 1 through 4 of 2 Peter chapter 1. So back in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, it reads this way. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. 
Okay, so now let's back up and let's go through these and um, make some comments. So Peter starts off this letter by describing himself and, I, and introducing himself not only as being a bond servant who is a willing servant for Christ. That's what a bond servant is. They're a willing servant, as we all should be bond servants of Christ. We all should be willing servants. And an apostle, meaning he's one that was sent of Jesus Christ. But we should also recognize that he uses both names here, which I think is interesting. He uses the name Simon and Peter. Now, Simon is a Hebrew name. It's a Hebrew name. And so, so he used this, this word. It's actually uh, pronounced Shimon. Shimon, it's a Hebrew name. But Peter was the name that Jesus gave him, which meant Petros. Okay? So it was an interesting thing. Now, now, I know some people think that because he was called Petros, and, you know, meaning stone, little stone is what it actually means, Pet, Petros, not Petros. Jesus was Petros, the large, the large stone. Peter was Petros. So uh, being that he was a small stone, he was just one of many small stones that builds up the church, just as we are many many small stones that actually build up this spiritual house that is called the church. So the, the church was not built upon Peter. So when he said, upon this rock, you know, you know, upon this rock, I'll build my... No, he, the church is not built on Peter, okay? The church is built, by what Peter, uh, built on what Peter said, that you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. That's what the church is built upon. It is not built upon Peter. It would never be built upon a man. It wouldn't have lasted two weeks if it was built upon a man. Okay, it's built upon Christ Jesus. So then here at the bottom of verse 1, it says, To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Like precious faith. I love the way he pronounced that, like precious faith. That simply means that the faith that I have, this is Peter speaking, he's saying to us that the faith that I have, your faith is the same. And it's the same value of everybody else's faith. I don't have any more faith or you don't have any less faith because I'm an apostle. We all have faith. We are all saved by faith, We're saved through faith, by grace. And this faith that we have uh, uh, this like precious faith is what makes us a family. It makes us church. It makes us a spiritual family. And it's by the righteousness of God. This is not of your own. This faith that we have and this salvation that we have is by the righteousness of God and not our own. It's not by our efforts. It's not by our own righteousness. Our righteousness is but filthy rags. Thank God that we serve a God <clears throat> who came in the form of Jesus Christ, who was a sinless God. So our righteousness is built upon his righteousness. Our salvation is built upon his righteousness. The righteousness of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, which is another testimony here for the deity of Jesus Christ. This is basically saying that, that Jesus is God. Jesus is God here, and this is a testimony to that. So there's several places in the Bible, because I know people ask sometimes, where did, Jesus, you know, where did it ever say in the Bible that Jesus was God? Well, this is just one of a few places Amen. where it says that Jesus is God, okay? Um, so then he goes into verse 2, and this is when he really begins to uh, talk about what comes to us as a result of being justified by faith or as a result of being in Christ Jesus, he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. And, and, and what he's saying here is that in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, when we continue to get knowledge of Jesus in the word of God, we have grace and we have peace. Through the knowledge of him, there was a bumper sticker. I don't know if you got, how many people remember this, but there was a bumper sticker out a while ago that says, no Jesus, K-N-O-W, no peace, K-N-O-W. But no Jesus, N-O, no peace, N-O. So what's is really interesting, and what he's saying is that when we know Jesus Christ, when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, when we get into his word, 
some kind of way we begin to experience more peace and grace in our life. I know it was that way for me, and I'm sure many of you can testify to the same thing. When we try to do it on our own and try to run around and do things on our own, make our own decisions and do things this way and do things that way on our own, never really had peace. Always thinking about it. Thinking about it at night. When you go to bed, oh, my God, did I do this right? Is this going to come back and bite me? Is that going to happen? No peace. No peace. But then when we begin to get into the word of God and we begin to let that pour over us and we begin to submit to that, we experience the peace of God. We experience the peace of God, and through that, grace as well. So we should grow in that. Um, so then he goes on in verse, th- uh, verse 3. He says, as his divine power has given to us all things that, t- that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So he's saying here that when we got saved, when we, became, when we were justified by faith, By the righteousness of Jesus Christ, when we did that, we received divine power or God's divine power came into us and began to do a work in us. So we received the benefits of his his divine power. Regeneration is a result of his divine power. We were changed by his divine power. That's why we had a heart change. That's why our appetites changed for, from, from things of evil to things of righteousness. The way we walked, where we were going, and the things that we did, those things changed as a result of his divine power. And not only that, but he changed us. We went from death to life through his divine power. That was a work of his power. That wasn't anything that we could have done, let alone anything that we did do. So it was his divine power, and through his divine power, we've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. And this is the thing that I really want to communicate. We have on the inside of us all that we need. To live godly. It's in us. The power is in us. To live godly. It's through his divine power. We don't have the wisdom to live godly. And in and of ourselves, we don't have even the desire to live godly in and of ourselves. But he, through his divine power, he has given us everything that we need. To live godly for life and godliness. And we get that through the knowledge of him. As we continue to study his word, we begin to understand more and more and more about how to live godly. It's knowing him. And it says here, who called us by his glory. (laughs) John, in the book of John, John chapter 1, he says, we beheld his glory as of the only begotten father full of grace and truth. So we beheld his glory and virtue. They were able to see. Now, this virtue that he's talking about here is is moral excellence, and we saw his moral excellence. We see it in his word, but they also witnessed it. Peter said, we witnessed his moral excellence. And it's the goodness of God that brings us to repentance. That's what draws us. It's his goodness, his moral excellence. That's what draws us to repent. He's good. We're not, but he's good. Thank God for his moral excellence that he has, that we have through him. So we go on because it's a blessing to know the beautiful things that happen as a result of being saved, of this, of this, this transformation that has taken place when we were justified by faith. And these are things that we may know. We have already known these things before, but maybe we don't remember those things and we don't necessarily live in those things. But we have all we need for life and godliness in us through the divine power of God and through the knowledge of him. 
who called us by his glory and virtue. And then in verse 4, he says, by which, meaning his, you know, through the knowledge of him, by which we also have or we have been giving exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Okay, now we're talking about the divine nature. We talked about the divine power. And now we're about to get in and talk about the divine nature. But I learned something as I was studying this. I've learned that when he talked about these exceeding great and precious promises, I've learned that there are over, now I haven't counted them, so I don't know for sure. But from what I understand, there are over 7,000 promises that God gives us in his word. Over 7,000 promises. We you know, I have a devotional that I study out of every, every morning. And I, I, I start my morning with this, this uh, Charles Spurgeon devotional. And every day, it starts with a promise. Every day, it starts with a promise. So there's so many promises that we are offered through the word of God. Our salvation is promised through the word of God. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus, on the calls on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. That's a promise. That's a promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise. That's a promise. I will dwell with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's a promise. Those are promises that we have through the word of God. Over 7,000 promises I'm told that we have. So we have these precious promises that through these, we are partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So now we have this divine nature. So we got saved, and it's the power of God, the divine power of God that changed us, transformed us into what we were, into what we are today. It took away, you know, or, or it began to change those appetites that we had for worldly things and change them into the appetites that we desire for godly things. Now, we must understand, and, you know, we've got to be honest with the fact that uh, there's a conflict there, right? And the conflict is the fact that we, you know, we, we, you know, we are still wrapped or this divine nature, you know, uh, is still wrapped, or this divine nature is still wrapped in, in flesh. So it's a human nature. It's wrapped in a human nature. So that's the conflict. Because the human nature also wants to rear its ugly head from time to time. And it wants to have uh, ascendancy in our life. But when we submit and surrender to the divine nature, that Christ-like nature, that's when we're able to deal with the pressures and the temptations of life. So he says we have this divine nature having escaped. And it's through that divine nature that we do escape the corruption or the depravity that is in the world through lust or our perverted desires. We'd escape that through lust. And so when we, we have this divine nature, let's, let's, let's start there. Every morning we get up, we know that we have in us a divine nature. And it's the word of God that we study and we understand what comes through that divine nature. And when we submit or surrender to that divine nature, when we resist the devil, but submit to God, then we are able to live a life that is Christ-like doesn't mean that we don't sin doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes we have to repent but it's the divine nature that even causes us to want to do that because we know that we have been in a, we're in agreement with God that what we did was sin we're in agreement with God that what we did was against his con or, or contrary to his divine nature well the reason why we have that is because of his divine nature that we received when we got saved because before I got saved, when I only had my human nature, I didn't care if I sinned. And neither did you. We didn't stop and repent when we sinned, when we did things that we weren't supposed to do, said things that we weren't supposed to say, went places we weren't supposed to go. We didn't stop and repent 
before we got saved, but after we got saved, we couldn't feel comfortable in that anymore. It's because of that divine nature. So that's the conflict. So now we know that God did a lot of things for us through his divine power. He gave us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And then we understand that we have these precious promises that come through us as we get to know him through the knowledge of him. And through our divine nature, we can escape the depravity or the corruption that's in the world through perverted desires. So now knowing that, moving on to verse 5. So now knowing that, knowing that everything that God did from verses 2 to verse 4, knowing everything that God did, now, here's a but coming. In verse 5, there's a but. And the but means that there's a shift. So we're going, to, we're going to shift now from what God did. And we're going to shift from what he accomplished in us through justification or through salvation. And now we're going to look at some things that we got to do. And that's a balance between sovereignty, which is what God did, and will, man's will. There's some things that we got to do. So in verse 5, he says, but also for this very reason. For the very fact that we have these precious promises or the very fact that we have all things that pertain to God, life and godliness in in us, because of that, he says, giving all diligence or intense effort, add to your faith. Add to your faith. Not add to be saved. Not add to your faith in a way that you got to add this in order to be saved. That's not what he's saying. Jesus Christ already took care of that. We're saved. If you trust in Christ, you're saved. You don't have to add things in order to be saved. But he's saying, add to your faith. Grow in your faith. Develop in your faith. Let's not stay where we are, where we were when we first got saved. Let's develop. And he's saying, let's add, or let's, yeah, let's add to your faith, starting with virtue or moral excellence that we talked about over in verse 3. This moral excellence that we have through our salvation. We have access to this through our divine nature. We have access to this moral uh, excellence that we have that helps us to fulfill the purpose that God has for us. And we all have a purpose. And that purpose is is to show forth the praises of God, the one who brought us out of darkness and into his marvelous light, as Peter told us back in chapter 2. We have that. So he said, add to your faith virtue. And then he says, into virtue, add knowledge. And this knowledge is not just a learning knowledge, the knowledge that comes through, uh, you know, reading the word of God and learning the word of God, but it's that knowledge that comes through allowing that knowledge that we have in him, through his word, to now be worked out in our lives, that it becomes practical with us or in us. It's that knowledge of, it's that practical knowledge, that practical wisdom of being obedient to the will of God through what we know about him through his word, exercising those things in our lives, living those things out. It's important as a Christian that what we know and believe becomes who we are and what we live. It's important as a Christian that we are able to do that. And then the next one, he says, is self-control. And in self-control, that just simply means this. Controlling our emotions and our passions rather than allow our emotions and passions to control us. And before we got saved, that's exactly what we did. Our emotions and our passions, they controlled us. They told us what to do. They told us where to go. They told us how to act, what to say. And we gave in to those emotions and passions. But now that we are saved, we should have self-control is what Peter is saying. You got to add self-control. And adding self-control is important because that's one of the things that helps us to be able to withstand those attacks from the enemy. And that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible actually talks about having self-control as being able to have control over your spirit. 
And it's the one who can have control over the spirit that actually is a strong person. It's a person that's even stronger than a worldly strong person. For example, over in Proverbs 16 and 32, he says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that rules his spirit than he who takes a city. And then contrary to that, in Proverbs 25 and 28, he said, whoever has no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down without walls. A city broken down without walls. So in other words, if we don't have that self-control to be able to control our desires, to be able to control our emotions, our passions, we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable to anything that the enemy throws at us. We're vulnerable to it, and we're like a city without walls. At any time, we can be attacked by the evil one, by whatever pleasure he desires to throw at us, and we fall for it because we have no self-control. And then next one he mentions is perseverance or patience, which is the ability to endure and maintain one's faith when 